The economy is in a precarious position at the moment. Signs are pointing to possible runaway inflation. The GOP is threatening not to raise the debt ceiling, which would, of course, close the government, furlough workers, undermine the U.S. global economic standing, and basically tank the economy here at home. Biden's response to, well, all of it has not been robust enough to really address the crisis. And then there's the looming specter of the Delta variant. Richard Wolf, whose latest book is The Sickness is the System. Got it right here. Yes, when capitalism, does. it's a great, it's, I keep it handy. Uh, subtitle, When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics or Itself. And you're also the host of Economic Update and a regular here and 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 really the voice of reason you have become. I uh, hate to put that tag on you if you didn't know you had that already, but you know, it's great to see you um, and and the message that you have getting out to to people. Um, you're joining us today to give us an overview of just how precarious the position we're in and the economic threat posed by the Delta variant. Thanks for joining me, Professor Wolf. My pleasure, Juliana. It's an important program that you have, and it's an honor for me uh, to be here on a regular basis and talk with you about it. Uh, so the Delta variant uh, breaking through in the U.S., causing people to get sick, causing people with vaccines uh, who are already vaccinated to, to get sick, this this can't be good news to our economy. No, it, it it's not only bad news, but it points up the bad way we've been handling this entire issue. And that in turn points up something that's part of the American character, I think. And uh, psychologists call it denial. It's when you're confronted with something that's a serious problem for which there may indeed be solutions, but rather than really going to sort out what the solutions might be, to choose the best option, hopefully, that you can, you instead try to push through the situation by pretending it isn't there. And I see most of our political leaders, left, right, and center, um, the mainstream at least, uh, practicing denial on a scale that is really, for me, uh, frightening. I'm used to it. I mean, I'm born and raised in America, so uh, it's part of me as it is of everybody else. But it's gone to the, you know, it's a little bit like the rain we've been having. You know, we have rain. But this much rain uh, in, in July makes you wonder, gee, maybe there really is something about this uh, climate issue and that we've been practicing denial around it, which everybody who knows about this knows we've been doing. So let me give you a brief rundown of what we've been denying. Okay, let's start with the obvious. Headlines today, inflation worse than we had been told to expect. Rents across America rising at a 7.5% annual clip, which far outstrips what any wage increase anybody has been talking about looks like, uh, number one. Number two, we're looking at an inflation that may last for years. The promises of our officials that it wouldn't happen or that if it happened, it would be temporary as if they could foretell the future. That's denial. The truth is you don't know. It may not last, but beyond that, everything else is purely a guess. But now let's get to some of the darker realities. We're not out of the woods with this disease, hmm. not even close. This variant is doing real damage. The 40% or so of Americans who haven't gotten the vaccine, many of whom seem to make it a matter of principle, are becoming incubators to keep this variant going. They thereby threaten everybody, mm. those who are vaccinated as well as those who aren't with the spread of this disease. The fact that the developed world, like the United States, has kept the vast majority of the vaccines for itself and not at all shared with the rest of the world will prove to be an idiotic misunderstanding of what infectious disease means. If there's a part of the world you're not vaccinating, the disease will fester there. And given modern transportation, if it's there, it's only a matter of time before it's here. 
and there's no way to stop that short of the kinds of lockdowns that, again, Americans have been outstanding in not wanting to do. <laughs> Here's another example. The United States was defeated in Afghanistan. You could call it a, a drawdown with the language. The games that are being played here are wonderful. We are adjusting. We are No, we're not. We were defeated. We went there 20 years ago in order to get rid of the Taliban, the organized uh, opposition there. And like the Russians before us, we couldn't do it. There's always a hundred reasons why you lose a war, just like there's a hundred why you won. But it's pure denial not to understand that the two major military efforts of the United States, one in Afghanistan and one in Iraq, have both been, from the standpoint of geopolitics, failures, defeats, and the rest is playing games of denial. Mm. True, the industrial, military industrial complex was able to make a lot of money off of both of those wars. That's true. And they could use their profits to build their enterprises. Has to be admitted, that's true. But if that was the purpose, then there were an awful lot of young men and women, American, Afghani, and Iraqi who gave up their lives, their physical and mental health for the profiteering of a very small number of mega defense producers. Mm. That's not a healthy sign. Mm. We have millions of people unemployed. We have an enormous and growing homeless population. I mean, let's be clear, the inequality of this country which people were complaining about 10 years ago, has gotten markedly worse. When this COVID hit and we were told, let's all whole work together, let's all sacrifice and we'll get through this together. Well, we may have gotten through it. That's not clear yet. Hmm. But doing it all together, no way did that happen. The 500 richest people, this was a remarkable story in the Wall Street Journal, and the numbers have been verified by others. 500 richest people got $8.4 trillion richer over the 18 months since the beginning of 2020. $8.4 trillion would be more than the money needed to vaccinate every last person on this planet before the year is out. That's the truth. But we're not using the 8.4 trillion. We're allowing the people, the 500, who were already the richest people on this planet to become more rich rather than vaccinate. I mean, if ever you wanted to see a, a system that isn't working, there it is. What in the world are you doing? Over the last year and a half, my last statistic to overload you with, <laughs> no. over the last Please. year and a half, uh, something on the order of 85 million Americans, somewhere between 80 and 85 million Americans had to file for unemployment compensation. Some of them were only unemployed a few weeks. Some of them were unemployed the whole time. But that's more than half the labor force. We usually number the labor force in this country at about 160 million right now. Mm -hmm. So if 80 to 85 had to file, that's one out of two workers. And when you're unemployed, we have every study you could imagine. Your, your likelihood of needing medical attention goes up. Your likelihood of having mental as well as physical issues arise in your life. Tensions with your spouse, tensions with your elderly, with your children, likelihood of alcoholism. I mean, I could go on. Unemployment is a very difficult, painful experience, which we just imposed on half of our labor force while the richest people became richer. This last week, we watched two of the richest people in the world, Elon Musk 
and Jeffrey Bezos having a fun time spending money to see who gets into what part of outer space sooner. I mean, you have to stop what kind of a society in the midst of this list of crises, and I could go on, what kind of society does such a thing? And the answer is a society desperately trying. And I include here Elon Musk and Jeffrey Bezos. Part of what they're doing is trying to imagine that we're in the happy, yuppie place where we can play these kinds of games because there's nothing serious going on. It's this, is a, this is a path that will not end well. It's actually, that's really interesting. It's incredibly vulgar that they yes. would do that given that money, given the fact that in their companies, they don't pay their workers a living wage, given the fact that hoarding up that money itself should be illegal and that they're not paying any taxes, their corporate taxes. I don't know about their personal taxes, but their corporate taxes. So yes, very, very vulgar. Um, a question for you that just came up while you were talking for me. You know, you you report on the homelessness. You are reporting on what's going on here. Those five things are things that I rarely hear about in other than the Elon Musk trying to make it to space uh, in the media. Do you think that there is a concerted media blackout so that people remain in denial? I know I was recently reading about, um, uh, about a concerted effort on the part of Fox News and other mainstream outlets. I believe this was in Mother Mother Jones, Mother Jones magazine, um, to to not report on the weather or the climate in any way that suggests that something funny's going on. Yeah, I think that that's been a, a policy of our media for a very long time. The obvious place where you used to see it and you still see it is in foreign affairs. I mean, the lack of understanding in the United States about events overseas, um, it's legendary. I mean, when, when I entertain Europeans, uh, folks from Latin America, Africa, I have to almost always within the first 24 hours, something has happened that shocks them and they, they turn to me and they turn to my colleagues and they say, don't people understand about fill in the blank, whatever the foreign issue is? And the answer is no, they, they, we don't. Every European country that I'm talking about right now, every European country has several of its major newspapers that regularly refer to what is going on in Iraq and Afghanistan as the defeat of the United States. And I'm not talking about left wing or, or anti-American, no, no, just your normal commercial profit. That's just understood that, that and, and by now, you know, they're familiar with America and they're not, they're would not never, I mean, it wouldn't even behoove the peace. I'm sorry to cut you off the, the no, peace no, movement to say we didn't win because America has to win. So we'd never yeah. get out of there if we admitted that we didn't win because America, you know, like this, this idea of we have to win, come hell, high water, deaths, et cetera. Yeah, you know, when I go to England, I'll get into trouble for saying this, but I'll say it anyway. When I go to England from time to time, I'm taken aback. Mm -hmm. I Many of the people understand perfectly well what's going on. Mm -hmm. But there's a remarkable number of British people, smart people, good people in many ways, but they don't seem to have gotten the memo that the British Empire isn't there anymore. They think somehow that in their lovely city of London, it is the center of the universe. And, and it, 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 you really understand. Look, part of me is I want to be compassionate. If you had a great empire, the British did, and it is no more, which is the case, that's hard. And you've been on a 100-year decline where every five years it's a little clearer that you aren't what you once were. And the United States, you know, is the emblem of that. We were once a minor, unimportant colony, and now we're the mother, and this is the little, England is a little baby. They used to refer to their prime minister, Tony Blair, as America's poodle, 
Right. Uh, you know, because, <laughs> yes. and that was across the board. It wasn't just people who didn't like him. His own Labor Party people were upset that whenever the United States said jump, his only response was how high. You know, it, it's awful. But you have to face that kind of, you can't pretend we're the equivalent. So we go to Afghanistan, we send half a million troops, they send 1,200 people, and we call it a coalition. This, uh. It's not a yes. coalition. That's a gesture that the British make. It has nothing to do with anything. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, it, it's a joke and not a good one. For, <laughs> for me, this is good. It's hard, but that's not a justification to pretend that it isn't happening because that's going to only make it harder because you're not making the decisions. You know, it's like with a doctor. Every doctor tells you, come early if you have something that's hurting or not going well, because the longer you wait, the more difficult it becomes to treat it properly. Mm -hmm. Professor Wolf, given the precarious nature, as, as you've been describing, of where we are now in our economy post-pandemic, and if we're post at all, I don't know. <laughs> and then we're we're about to see, you know, people are very concerned about the Delta variant and the fact that right now the vaccines are not as effective as one would have hoped against this uh, variant. It's hard to picture what that might look like. What will happen in the economy if we have to close down again? If some of the red states get really overtaken by by this disease, if if that comes into the blue states, because as you said, uh, you know, viruses know no borders, states, national, or otherwise. Um, how will our economy handle a potential shutdown? Well, there's two ways to answer. The, the easiest answer is to say, we have an abysmal record so far with COVID, and therefore I would have to say that the chances of managing this new problem, the new variant and what it can and what it is doing, uh, there's no reason to expect we're gonna do better than we did the last time. Uh, let me remind everyone, the United States has the capacity to produce all the tests that are needed, all the masks that are needed, ventilators, ICU units, all of it. We didn't do it. It's not because we don't have the factories, we do. It's not because we don't have the workers to make those things. We do. It's not that we don't have experience in making that kind of equipment. We do. So it isn't technical. It isn't labor. It isn't management. It's a system that made all of those workers, managers, and companies decide to do something else, not to produce the tests, the vaccines in time. Put the vaccines aside, it's a little different problem. But the tests, the masks, the arrangement of uh, social distancing so we wouldn't have to interrupt our children's education, all the things that could have and should have been done that weren't done. Why weren't they? Because this is a, a profit-driven system. Those corporations decided that the most profitable thing for them to do was not to make a mask and stick it in a warehouse for who knows how many months before uh, people are sick enough to need them. We need that for public health, but that's not profitable. And here comes the dangerous argument. In our society, we do what's profitable first. And if that means we don't do what the people need, well, the people's needs get sacrificed. Sacrificed. That's why we have 600,000 dead people in our community. We're the richest country or one of the richest countries in the world. We have a well-developed medical system, and we are number one in the number of dead people. That is a statistic that should stop everybody and say, what in the world are we doing wrong? And the sad reality is what's wrong is a system that holds all of us hostage to the minority who live off profits, who can make the decision I'm not going to make a mask. I'm going to invest in something else that's more profitable for me. Whoa, stop. Mm -hmm. Profit for a few and the, and the death of 600,000. I mean, a society with that outcome has to ask itself questions. And I'm convinced 
that if we have a now this variant, if it overtakes us, we're not ready. Mm-hmm. We we haven't even figured out how to vaccinate the people against what we know it will do. We are allowing the most crazed arguments to get treated as if they were serious. I want my freedom to not be vaccinated. The government isn't going to... Now, let's stop for a minute if we could. We have something in this country called traffic lights. You see, if you want to go across an intersection, there's this light over above. You probably noticed it. It gets green and red and yellow. And we're all taught, even when we're little kids in school, that if it's red, you stop. If it's green, you go. And if it's yellow, you slow down. Whoa, not rocket science here. And why do we do that? Because otherwise, getting through an intersection, you take your life in your hands. And most of us do that several times a day. We don't want to be at that risk. So here's what we do, folks. And I'm talking to the red states. We limit your freedom. The government tells you when it's red, you're going to stop. And when it's green, you're going to go. And if you don't obey, they're going to get you a ticket Mm -hmm. and maybe arrest you because you're, here's the game, you're endangering everybody, even yourself. That's exactly what the vaccine is about. Mm -hmm. This the idea the government shouldn't tell me what to do. Really? Do you really want to drive through the intersection and pretend there's no light there? Mm -hmm. You will die. A horrible crash accident that will take your life, your loved one, those of other people. This isn't, this is, that this can be put forward in a major way. That's already a sign of a society disintegrating. It doesn't even have the glue to hold us all together that makes us understand that life is always a process of giving something up to get something else. We give up our freedom to go through the intersection when we want to achieve the peace of mind that we're not going to get killed every time we try to ride drive down the road. Whoa, that this can't be understood, that's as bad a symptom of economic and political decay as what COVID is all about. I just don't know if we can stand, and I can't, you know, I haven't lived through the collapse of an economy yet. Right. Um, I, I just don't, I'd rather not, but uh, I, I don't know if our economy can stand without some sort of crumbling at the seams, not just the social incohesion, but the real you know, devaluation of the currency, the shuttering of things like the fire department that you might actually need, the police, uh, you know, that it's hard to picture being able to live through another year with another shutdown. And I know all the moms that I'm talking to are terrified and they don't know what school choice they should do. Some have no choice. Some have the choice to keep their kid home, maybe, or some have, you know, different choices. People are just, I, I have friends who are going to go live with their families in Europe. And some of those countries are already shutting down. They're trying to get over there before, like the Netherlands, I think it is. And Greece is talking about shutting down. You know, some of these countries are already shutting down again. And I don't, it, why is no one even reporting about these? Like you said, back to the foreign press. You don't even hear that. Does anyone know that Greece is considering shutting down? Anyone watching this, please put in the chat. If you happen to have heard that already and your name is not like Stravalos, put in the chat. <laughs> you know, this is. I, you know, Part of my family is French. And every now and then I get an email from them. I've gotten them again recently. Because you have to remember, in Europe, the phenomena, ev- almost every weekend, that some ridiculous number of Americans have been shot in our cities, in the country, uh, have had some uh, gun interaction that has killed a child or uh, wounded somebody, and that there are hundreds of them across. I believe the 4th of July weekend was some sort of record. I saw one headline, 450 gunshot killings or woundings in the long weekend in the country as a whole. 
I get the email from my French relatives. Rick, the way I'm known there, please remember, we have a room at the back of the house, or we have a little house in the back uh, over there. You could stay there if it, because for them, this is the Wild West, not the nice Wild West of the movies, but a Wild West that they can't imagine. It's a major event in any French city. If anybody is shot, this is unusual, this is extreme, this is immediately... We, in New York City, where I live, I mean, people are shot every day. It's, a, it's an event, like in certain poor countries, when you walk down the street, you step over the, the homeless people that are lying in the doorways. You know, it, and people, after a while, they don't, literally, they don't see it anymore. Americans, that's where the denial comes in. We are not confronted. We have learned to live with and pretend that all of this is an amusement. Isn't it interesting how Richard Branson went into space on his little rocket ship? I, you know, you shake your head. Or that people are seriously mobilized to not get vaccinated. I mean, I understand the suspicion of the pharma companies. That's well-deserved. That, that's reasonable. You should be suspicious. They certainly have behaved in a way that if you're paying attention, you ought to be suspicious because they too are in the profit-making business first and the healthcare a distant second. Mm -hmm. That's why they have to tell us the opposite because we all know <laughs> right. what's going on here. You know, but, but nonetheless, to protect yourself and to be part of a community that doesn't want to die or get sick for the rest of your life, you have to, again, you, you really do. And this is not, you know, alarmism or, or whining or glass half full. This is the kind of attention you have to pay to the risks that are part of everybody's life in order that you have a chance to survive them by taking steps that can address them. But if you pretend there are no problems, then for sure they will overwhelm you. Professor Wolf, our final question today, are you yourself concerned or perhaps what are your top concerns for the economy should the Delta variant force, um, you know, force us back into our homes at some point? Yes, I, if I had to, you know, there are many problems, but if I had to pick kind of what in the end I keep coming back to, it is the level of inequality. Uh, I, I don't believe in predicting. I don't. I can't see the future any better than anybody else can. But if if I'm right, then that's our Achilles' heel. We live in a capitalist system that is making the rich richer and making life harder and more precarious for the vast majority. And that can't go on forever. It can go on a long time. I admit that. But it can't go on forever. There will be too many voices like mine, like yours, like other reasonable people who are going to sooner or later, hopefully not through a personal tragedy, but often it will be that way, have to come to terms with this. Mm. And, and, and particularly in the United States, for most of the 20th century, the, the defense, the celebration of American capitalism was it created a great middle class that most Americans were in the middle. There were a few Richies and there were a few desperado poor, but we were all in the middle. That's over. The vast majority of Americans know that that's gone. Well, that's a society that is now confronted with an inequality when that was the defense that we weren't unequal for the capitalist system. The more that inequality gets stuck in our noses, like the contest of Elon Musk and Jeffrey Bezos about amusements in space, the more we're confronted with that, the more the justification for this system becomes thinner and thinner and the voices of criticism more persuasive and more persuasive. I can see it in my own life, in the invitations I get, in the response People are, are, are upset. They're hungry to try to understand what's going on. And in my head, 
that's where this economy is going to really crumble. And I don't know which particular shock will take us over that edge. Could be another variant spreading like wildfire more than it already is. It could be uh, learning that the, the vaccines work, but not forever, and stop working, and that this booster may, may not work, and who's going to pay for the booster shots, etc. I could just see these are problems that are accumulating ahead of any capacity of this society to cope. Last point. When a society breaks down, when an empire falls apart, those at the top are in the best position to hold on to what they have. And as you go down the socioeconomic ladder, people are less and less equipped to handle it, which means the pain of the downturn gets shunted off, offloaded by those at the top so that the ones at the bottom feel it the most. And I think you're going to see this turn this society into a very different thing from what it has been. And that the comfort level of those who pretend otherwise, those in denial, is going to be disturbed in ways they could have avoided if they hadn't been so hung up with the denial. Professor Wolf, always so much to talk about. I really always appreciate you coming on the program. I do encourage everyone who's watching our show to find the Democracy at Work channel on YouTube and specifically watch this last episode of um, Epino Blah. last episode of Economic Update, uh, where you talk about uh, inflation and what is going on there. And uh, you also talk about the quote unquote worker shortage, which I think we should rename the uh, we're not going to pay you, uh, you know, right. we're not going to pay you shortage or, or platform or whatever. Um, thank you again so much for being with us. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Juliana, and look forward to talking with you next time. You're watching ACT-TV.